is a presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Let's go to our man, Al in Homo Sasa. What's going on, brother? It's, isn't it wonderful? I went ahead and invested in your uh, Tiger Dollars, <laughs> and I went ahead and got the gold report <laughs> for a year, and, and also your, morning, your, your call letter and stuff like that. Like that and I got over a fifty percent return in one day, not counting uh, everything else. But I just want to thank you. Tom's not perfect, but he tells you how to put your stops in, and he keeps your losses small. You can take your small losses, but then all of a sudden you'll be like Dave Bruce, and you'll hit a home run. I mean, a big home run. Yeah. And put the money in your pocket. Okay, and I mean, brother. I You're awesome, man. Thank you. Now, Tom O'Brien. <laughs> Welcome, folks. Jacob Shoup filling in again for Tom O'Brien. He'll be back Tuesday, back with some more good insights. The market is up today. If you didn't catch our 3 p.m. update, uh, the market just does not uh, is not really acknowledging what Powell was saying. Again, if you missed it yesterday, he was saying there is still an up, a risk to the upside with inflation uh, that they might have skipped uh, some rate increases, uh, you know, this time around. Uh, but he expects more to come uh, throughout the rest of the year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can't talk about him. You get a little something in your throat there, huh? Anyway, um, GDX up 0.44. We're looking at the gold contract. Uh, this did pretty well today on some significant volume. Uh, definitely some big movement on it. With the dollar getting depressed quite a bit. Uh, we'll talk a little bit. I want to show you a chart here in a few uh, regarding the kind of uh, dwindling percentage uh, share that the dollar has in uh, re the reserves, basically, of, uh, of different national banks. While that's mainly being taken up by euros um, and the actual fall of the dollar, as some people are calling it, will probably take quite a while. It's still something to be uh, cognizant of, but as it stands now, um, the, the dollar is going down quite a bit. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. It's been fighting for the 101 level. Uh, we did not touch 102 just yet, uh, but we'll see what we, can ha uh, what we can get done through the rest of this day and uh, tomorrow. Meta up significantly. Four uh, percent today, almost 3.5. We have right here on the, uh, the the trading program. Tesla down a little bit again, breaking its kind of 14-day uh, streak there. Uh, trading up. Apple up one percent. Steel Dynamics fighting. So we were talking in the den before the show, uh, and it was brought up that the millennials just keep investing, right? And there's such a large portion of of uh, traders now, and I want to bring in Gen Z as well, right? So people born 1996 below, and I think that there was some decent insight that they might be continuing to drive this kind of uh, bull market and and avoid any kind of sentiments of uh, you know something bearish. And the thing I'll say to that too is, young folks, they've only ever known this kind of market, right? And the way that the culture is, uh, you know, with different YouTubers, uh, different, you know, TikTokers, what have you, there is so much conversation and there really is like a subculture of, uh, you know, becoming financially um, independent based on the stock market, right? And keep in mind too, you know, for, for younger folks, maybe people who are in their early 20s right now, they grew up seeing people make, you know, millions of dollars off extremely risky investments such as Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and also saw people make tons of money during 2020 when you had that massive pullback in March. And, uh, you know, if you just bought at that area, of course, you know, you made money. And everyone makes money in the bull market. And so seeing this as a way to become financially independent, as a lot of the younger people do, kind of conceding that, uh, you know, there might be a bear market or, uh, you know, you might have to reel back some kind of investments for a time being. Or maybe the stock you picked wasn't the best idea. That's, you know... You're fighting against a really powerful uh, psychological kind of bias with that, right? And maybe they don't want to admit something like that. So you got to keep this kind of uh, effort going, right? Because it's your, your way out. So just some food for thought regarding that. And uh, it would be interesting to see any kind of data of how much young people are, are buying uh, and how risky they are. I will say, and this is anecdotal, of course, uh, but 
a lot of the younger folks I know, and again, I'm, I'm going to talk with the younger 20s range, uh, made extremely risky investments over the past few years, right? Like, had you analyzed this based on any kind of thing that a university or traditional knowledge would have taught you, you know, you would not buy it, right? They did, and uh, they, they made a killing on it. And I, I can probably name about three people I have in my mind right now uh, who, who have done this. And it's, you know, it's pretty interesting, right? You know, of course, reality at some point probably catches up. But um, for the time being, uh, you know, this market's green. And I, I think the young folks are benefiting a lot from that. Anyway, uh, you know, on the show, I like talking about uh, cybersecurity quite a bit and kind of the, um, the market surrounding that and how I personally believe that investing in cybersecurity firms now is, is going to be pretty lucrative in the future. Um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to it for some time. Uh, you know, we had legislation passed around data protection, security and retention, and that's fine. Uh, but what's going to start happening is, you know, your, your big companies that get targeted uh, they're going to start, historically, you know, everyone kind of saw them as victims, right? Well, the impact, and I'm talking about the financial impact and uh, the impact of people's security and privacy uh, is becoming so uh, high that they're going to start having to bear the costs of it. And that's going to be mandated by the government at some point. Uh, to give you a little idea of, you know, how intense this is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but... It turned out that the Chinese have uh, breached hundreds of public's private networks, a uh, security firm says. A suspected uh, state-backed Chinese hackers used a security hole in a popular email security appliance to break the networks of hundreds of public and private sector organizations globally. Nearly a third of them uh, government agencies, including foreign ministries, uh, the cybersecurity firm Mandiant, who is also the target of a pretty intense hack about a decade ago, or excuse me, um, about five years ago. Uh, this is the broadest cyber espionage campaign known to be conducted by the Chinese Nexus threat actor. So, you know, listen, when, when it's state actors, you know, you're in a whole other realm of, of threat, right? Because this becomes a little bit more existential to an entire population of people. Um, but what state governments do as well is uh, attack us on an enterprise level. OK, and the, our government in the U.S. has understood that finally. And uh, that's why they're forcing larger companies uh, to take kind of matters into their own hands and follow certain guidelines at the risk of some kind of sanction. The Wall Street Journal posted an article, uh, and this was today, earlier, a Cyber Investment Flows Update, June 2023. Investment in cybersecurity firms and startups fell by as much as two-thirds by the first quarter of 2023. Indications are that corporate budgets for cyber spending will increase or remain the same. And I think this is a major misstep, right? Again, this kind of shows that the upper level, you know, your upper, upper level decision makers inside um, enterprise level kind of uh, companies aren't getting the message yet. And what is it going to take? And it's going to take more breaches from threat actors, essentially, um, until they lose tons of money. I mean, they're dropping by billions of dollars on investments. And I, I don't think this is smart. The years coming... Uh, this current administration, which everyone takes over as well, this is going to become a far greater focus. And so while spending has gone down this, sec uh, this quarter, keep an eye out because uh, it will increase over the next few years. Folks, stay tuned. We have Tim Ord on next. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. 
Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Welcome back, folks. Right now, we have Tim Ord on the line. Tim Ord publishes a newsletter called The Ord Oracle. Tim, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. So, you know, we have a pretty uh, intense week and an intense day. What are you making out of it? Well, I sent you over two charts. Hope you got them. I got them right here. Uh, uh, I think you uh, let's see we're looking uh, at the uh, one that has uh, the first one I'm looking at has the weekly spy support in the VIX and the second one we're looking right, at the 10-day uh, trend yeah I, I, I sent you another one right after that hopefully we got the right chart we'll get but, it let's uh, pull it up here uh, anyhow the bottom window is a VIX and anything below 17 usually the VIX is in a trending mode and this is a weekly chart and I could have gone back a lot farther, but anyhow, it, it, it any time the the uh, shaded uh, tan, or the shaded pink areas are times when the uh, uh, VIX is below 17, and so I shaded those areas on the market. And we've been below 17 since basically beginning of April, and we're still below 17. We're coming in around 14, so we're so we're in a trending market. Um, but there's some. Uh, I guess breaks in the dam, I guess you might say, is starting to show up. And I circled there on top uh, when the weekly uh, S&Ps, uh, this is the SPYs, gets above the, the upper Bollinger Band. Uh, last time that happened uh, was back in November, uh, yeah, about November of last year. And with a little bit, market's going up too fast. If it gets too far away above the upper Bollinger Band, usually the market uh, uh, gets near a stall area, and we think we're probably going to do that. Um, is there a top today? Not necessarily today, uh, but probably sometime next week. But it's not going to be a, a top of any consequence, not like we had like January of last or this year where the market peaked out and went down all the way into, um, or la actually last year, 2022, mm. you know, December of last, or yeah, it'll be January of last year. Mark went down in October, but we're looking for, we're probably nearing some sort of a consolidation phase. Is what I'm saying, because the market is getting too exuberant here. So when the uh, market on a weekly time frame closes above the upper Bollinger Band, you're you're getting close to some sort of a consolidation, but uh, can flip to, to the next chart. Yeah. We're looking All at right. the 10-day trend right now. Yep. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a 10 day trend. Now, this is a daily chart. And again, the bottom window is the um, VIX, and I shaded that in pink. Every time it's below 17, normally you're in a trending market. Mm -hmm. And again, we've been trending up since April. Well, now what's happening, we got the next window up. It's a 10 day average of the trend. And I marked the times in blue arrow or blue lines at the time it got down to point eight or lower. And at minimum, uh, it goes into at least consolidation. And we have back in 2021, I have two circles on the SPYs there. And I showed you when it got below 0.8, you know, you mark it, you know, at least stalls a little bit, goes sideways, and probably then it starts going up higher again. Other times, if you get on a down market, uh, it, it marked significant lows. It picked out the, uh, in 2022, it picked out, looks like about the, the April, the August, the August high, uh, picked out the um, March high of last year, and had a couple of highs in January and February there. Well, if you do today's analysis, the trend closes right around 0.56, uh, or we're at 0.6 right now. Uh, and, you know, right around 0.6, you're going to close on the 10-day trend around 0.8 today. Uh, so you're kind of in the danger zone. So it kind of with the weekly uh, S and P Y is above the mid Bollinger or the up on the upper Bollinger band, suggesting consolidation, and you got a ten day trend down around point eight. You know, the time of the rally is kind of ex getting exhausted here, and today we're up uh, decently. Advanced client is actually pretty strong, but I think we're going into some sort of at least a short term exhaustion move. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably not today is going to be the high, but I think sometime probably early next week. How big is the high? Uh, you know, the worst case scenario, uh, I didn't draw a trend line there, but you got quite a bit of support around 420. Right. Which is quite a ways down. There's no guarantee we'll reach that, but that's a possible target to the downside. Uh, but in general, this market's going to end up higher this year. We're probably at minimum are going to get back to the old highs back up around that 470 area. That was reached in January 2022, but you know, sometime uh, maybe next week, see a high, maybe the week after the latest, and uh, uh, probably see a worthwhile pullback that could last into the July 4th time frame. A lot of times, holidays can mark highs or lows. Sure, I thought this year could be a high. I think it turned out it could be a low or something. I don't know, but um, right. I'm getting. Go ahead. No, I'm, you know, so I'm looking at the first chart, too, and, and that's what I was going to ask, right? You can see, you know, in November of 2021, when it when it really passes that Bollinger Band, right? You get yeah. maybe a, a yeah. month of consolidation and then a, and then a pullback. Or, do you foresee something like that happening, too, or kind of just consolidation until going higher with what we see right now? Yeah, I think we'll see. I don't think we'll, we're not heading into a major high, but I do have a, a you know, a support area listed there. I thought we we may get down to support at 420, yeah. um, you know, scare everybody, get everybody worried again, and, and probably start up from there. It's kind of hard to pick how, you know, how this thing is going to consolidate, but I do think it could look similar to what happened back in November of 2021, where it kind of flipped sideways for a couple of weeks and we got a decline. Right. Um, uh, you know, Marcus actually had a, you know, it's, it's been running up since, uh, you know, basically March. Right. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it has a decent rally, you know, it's not going to go up forever. So No, certainly. Um, and, and, and definitely over the past, at least, you know, month of trading, I mean, it, it has gone out, gone up substantially, right? So. Yeah, it's gone up pretty, pretty, pretty substantially. And so, you know, but, you know, so far, if you look at the bottom window again, I mean, the VIX so far is not showing any danger here. And usually the VIX, rises before the top actually happens. There's another interesting indicator. Today marks six days up in a row. Uh, if you go back and check history, when the market's up six days in a row, uh, like it is right now, if the market stays up today, which probably most likely it will, uh, if you're up six days in a row, the market will be higher within five days, 83% of the time. So if you're doing odds, you'll see a minor high probably, you know, even today or tomorrow, and the market may pull back, but you should make a higher high within five days, 83% of the time. So at least at worst, today's high is going to be tested probably sometime next week. 
and that will depend what the VIX does on, on this minor pullback. It will be a minor pullback, nothing of significance. But, you know, it could shake up a little bit. A little bit. And if the market does pull back and the VIX goes up and the market rallies again to test, you know, say today is a high. It's just, mm-hmm. I'm not saying it is, but say we go back up and test wherever the high is that's today or tomorrow. And the VIX does not make a, a lower or it gets back above 17, that would actually add quite a bit of confirmation that the market is at least making that worthwhile high. That's what I'm kind of looking for. Absolutely so. fascinating. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. What you just said, too, about that 85% chance, that's 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 interesting. I would, you know, if that is the case, uh, I would love to check that out. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for joining us. All right, thank you. Take care now. Mm-hmm. Bye. Folks, we'll be right back. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly Gold Report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African RAND, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at tfnn.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. For free, each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no cash or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFM. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. That was a pretty great interview with Tim Ord. Hope you all thought so, too. Uh, I was talking a little bit earlier about um, some behaviors of Gen Z and kind of where they're at. I read this article, I thought it was pretty interesting, good insight, is actually 64% of Gen Xers have stopped saving for retirement. Those are people born after 64. Uh, while their parents belong to the, uh, quote, greatest generation, uh, Gen X may be soon carving out the reputation as the, quote, broke generation. A recent survey conducted by Clever Real Estate polled 1,000 Gen Xers born between 65, excuse me, 65, not 64, and 1980 uh, to find out how they fare when it comes to personal finances and the road to retirement. A staggering 56% of Gen Xers said that they have less than $100,000 saved for retirement. 
and uh, 22, 000, excuse me, 22 percent said they have yet to save a single cent. Whoa. Uh, while the desire to retire may be there, the money just isn't. A whopping 64 percent of respondents said that they stopped saving for retirement, not because they don't want to, but because they simply cannot afford to. The reasons for the lagging savings uh, varied, with many citing poor economic conditions and backbreaking student debt as retirement roadblocks. With the eldest members well into their 50s, the reality is that Gen Xers are facing a retirement crisis, and unless they take action now, they won't be able to retire comfortably, if at all. One of the main reasons why Gen Xers have yet to save enough for retirement is that they have faced several financial challenges throughout their life. A majority entered the workforce during the recession in the early 1990s, and that made it difficult to secure stable jobs and, uh, and earn decent wages. So, you know, this isn't just, you know, the millennials uh, who famously don't have any money. It's not the Gen Zers either who are kind of just really starting to get into the workforce in a, uh, any meaningful way. You have Gen X, too. And, I mean, these are people who are in their late 50s at, at the oldest, right, um, who aren't able to uh, are not going to really be able to retire. I, I remember reading this. I, I cannot remember which uh, publisher it was from, but it was a few days ago. And it was one of those kind of, you know, clickbaity headlines, but, it, it you know, it was a legitimate article, um, you know, from a well-known source. And uh, the question was, is can I live on... $90,000 a month when I'm retired. And it's like, you know, that's a crazy question, especially considering when, you know, now the next generation up behind the baby boomers um, is not going to be able to, I mean, how do, how do you get out of this, right? What does their end of life look like? You know, it's pretty significant. Um, and this has been a question for so long, and, and maybe people kind of avoided it because the, the main you know, people making a noise about it were millennials, and they were still young, and obviously there's some behavioral things that younger people have that, that might not be uh, positive for savings, but we're not looking at Gen X, right, who are uh, the direct descendants of the baby boomers, and, um, you know, they, they, they learned at least some kind of financial um, literacy, and this is still occurring with them. The student debt issue is interesting as well because they're about to resume student debt payments, and uh, it doesn't seem, <laughs> essentially what happened is people adjusted uh, to having the extra money that they had, right, um, when the student loan payments were uh, frozen. I'm trying to pull up this article for you. Bum, bum, bum. Just give me a second to find it. Here we go. This is from The Guardian. The U.S. Stone, uh, student loan interest to resume in September and payments in October. Um, Haha, ha. let me get this out of uh, Paylock for you and we'll get back to it. But, but yeah, and so one of the big conversations is, you know, you have a lot of people at, at least, um, again, saying that they're not going to pay uh, their student loans back when it starts again. Obviously, that's not going to really work uh, because the bank always gets theirs, right? Um, but this is going to, again, now be really significant. And in some way, you know, I, I might be wrong on this and, and maybe missing some dynamic to it, but that's going to soak up a lot of liquidity. You know, um, obviously it's going to soak up a lot of money for people who really may not be able to afford having less money. Um, but it'll also probably put the brakes on some younger folks who have enough money to spend. And maybe we might see a little bit of uh, disinflation because of that. It'll be quite interesting to see. Um, at least going back to this Gen X article, it says... They also uh, faced significant student loan debt with the average amount owed being a whopping 43,438 per borrower. Uh, Generation X holds 38.8% of the 1.63 trillion in federal uh, student loan debt, more than any other generation. Honestly, quite uh, an impressive amount. I mean, there's even stories now of people having to pay something like $100,000 or owing that much uh, in student loan debt. I, I mean, it really... Give me a second. Let me try to pull up this article for you. The paywalls, I guess they're worth it, folks, but uh, sometimes we got to read, you know? Yeah, my computer's not pulling it up. Anyway, we can move off of that. I, I do think there will be some major impact of it as well. I actually haven't spoken to any of my friends 
in my age group um, about what they're going to do regarding student loans. Um, and I'm supposing that it's on everyone's mind, um, but nobody's really trying uh, to address it. We talk a little bit about energy and the future of that. Uh, you know, there's, I was just talking with a buddy of mine, and uh, I, I'm not going to do this, but it, we were just at least fantasizing about it. But with that uh, $7,500 tax credit from Tesla, you know, both of us, we could sell our cars and get a Tesla Model 3 for something like $7,000 and just finance that and uh, look a little bit cooler driving uh, than, than we do now. Uh, at least on the end for China, they're giving the green light uh, to nuclear reactors that burn thorium. Uh, that fuel could power the country for 20,000 years. That's what they say, at least. Uh, it has several advantages over uranium reactors, including safety, uh, reduced waste, better fuel efficiency, and suitability. I also think uh, the RFK Jr., who's running, um, he's a proponent of thorium power, which I thought was super interesting. Uh, China's nuclear safety watchdog has issued an operational permit uh, for the nation's first thorium reactor. They also have the world's largest uh, hydroelectric dam. Uh, it is really quite an impressive um, <laughs> build, I would say. Um, and as these newer countries, right, or excuse me, these developing countries get to a point where they're going to become more established, right? Um, you know, for instance, I, I look at the kind of conundrum that Africa faces, all right? They are in you know, developing with a capital D, correct? And for them to get to a point where they can really uh, industrialize uh, in a meaningful way to kind of get out of that phase, uh, the way that it would be now is they would burn tons of coal. Uh, this you know, obviously pollutes their land around here. This is an issue that China was facing entirely. Um, and furthermore, they have such a large population at this point because of some you know, they, they had a population boom because they were getting resources from around the world, um, but they weren't dealing with that subsequent population decline that you get after um, a few decades of industrialization. So um, you're going to have to find energy for all of those people uh, to basically get onto the grid and power them. And while this method is a little bit more expensive, and by a little bit I mean it's, it's substantially more expensive than uh, burning coal, uh, on the long term, it makes the environment in those areas better. That increases wealth and increases well-being for the population. So some food for thought regarding that. And I think the more we go into the future, we're going to see more of this. Folks, stay tuned. We will be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Biotech is booming, but for how long? Whether you think the biotech bull has room to run or has run its course, trade LABU or LABD. Direction's daily S&P Biotech three times bull and bear ETFs. Visit directioninvestments.com slash biotech today.
An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien. All right, so the labor strike essentially that was going on in the ports on the West Coast has, uh, I guess they've reached some kind of agreement with the union, and that was $5.2 billion in cargo was just stuck off the West Coast. Furthermore, you had just lines of uh, vessels on the... Uh, off the docks there, and that's just kind of a management nightmare. So hopefully that can ease up a little bit and uh, supply chains can kind of get past this. Um, but yeah, earlier today, they, they finally reached some kind of at least tentative agreement uh, regarding it. And so maybe that can bring some prices down um, at some point. Talking a little bit earlier on the cybersecurity front and how companies just aren't spending money in it right now um, off of massive spending spree that they had. This is a really good article, um, and it's about quantum computing, right? And so, what we'll go into this a little bit, but one of the things I want to bring up, right, is uh, your passwords, okay? Everything that you use to keep safe. It's um, basically encrypted by something called hashing, okay? And it just takes the letters you have and it generates a random code. Um, uh, tied to that, right? And only the computers can communicate with it. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways that they've achieved encryption and a lot of different forms of hashing, right? And uh, there are definitely tools that have been used in order to crack these and the hashing gets a little bit better every time. You know, maybe you add in uh, just a bunch of random strings uh, to it once you uh, compute the hash. But the main problem that exists, right? So you, you, you've had this, uh, a bunch of breaches and a lot of companies suffer from breaches every year um, in their databases and they get user information. And uh, it's not consequential uh, immediately because those encryption, that encryption is kind of a little bit hard to break. When you get into quantum computing, the big fear is, and, and probably why like on the, uh, you know, under the wraps of this, uh, the, the push for this is, uh, is dire, uh, is because once you get something like quantum computing, they can break these hashes. And so everything that exists and that is in some database of a threat actor or some kind of foreign government um, that is currently unable to be encrypted, once they break quantum computing, um, those will be uh, cracked within a matter of, of minutes. It's just more of a, it's more of a matter of what group of hash are they going to send to this quantum computer. And so, you know, you kind of got to search for it because it's, you know, information on this as it's not really uh, being presented uh, in, in, you know, on the top media. Um, but there are major pushes to try to be the first people to beat this and then get into quantum encryption, right? Which if you, I, I won't go into all that because it's, I mean, I don't even really fully understand it at all. Um, but uh, the amount that I do, it's, it's vastly different than the kind of encryption that we uh, do now. So we'll break into this. Uh, the quantum computers today are small in computational scope. The chip inside your smartphone contains billions of transistors, while the most powerful quantum computer contains a few hundred of the quantum equivalent of a transistor. What IBM showed here is really amazing. Uh, excuse me, is really an amazingly important step in that direction of making progress towards serious quantum algorithmic design. Uh, while researchers at Google in 2019 claimed that they had achieved quantum supremacy 
a task performed much more quickly on a quantum computer than a conventional one. Uh, IBM's researchers say that they have achieved something new and more useful, albeit more modestly named. We're entering in this phase of quantum computing that I call utility, says Jay Gambetta, vice president of IBM Quantum, the era of utility. Uh, present day computers are called digital or classical because they deal with bits of information that are either ones or zeros. And this is kind of what differs with the quantum, right? Um, a quantum computer performs calculations on quantum bits or qubits that capture a more complex state of information. Just as thought experiment by the physicist Erwin Schrodinger postulated that a cat would be in the quantum state that is both dead and alive, that is a binary one and zero. But a qubit can be both one and zero at the same time. So you kind of get almost this like three dimensional or four dimensional aspect uh, to processing at that point. Uh, and it really is crazy to think about too, like with, with the advancements that we've made really in processing, it's still at its base. And this is so important, you know, to kind of understand if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, at its base, computing is still just, is this value zero or is it one? And um, when quantum computers come up, that's, that's going to just be dominated instantly. Uh, that allows quantum computers to make many calculations in one pass, while digital ones have to perform each calculation separately. By speeding up computation, quantum computers could potentially solve big, complex problems in fields like chemistry and material science uh, that are out of reach today. What, to that point with, with chemistry, um, you can also extend into the pharmaceuticals. And I was reading this paper, uh, and I, I guess this has been technology for quite some time, um, but there are databases of different compounds and it's, and it's used by pharmaceutical researchers. Uh, but essentially, you know, you, you essentially pay for the data, right, of these molecules. And um, from what I understand, you can essentially form new compounds. Now, it's all digital, right? And it's not, you know, you're not getting an actual, like, tangible compound out of it. Uh, but I thought that was really uh, amazing. And, and as it is now, they're doing it manually. But when AI gets better and you get something like quantum computing who can just do everything uh, in, in a very small amount of time. I mean, we could get new chemical um, kind of analogs uh, that we would have never gotten prior, right? Because it's just, it's more effortless this way. Um, when Google researchers made their supremacy claim in 2019, they said their quantum computer performed a calculation in three minutes and 20 seconds, and that would take about 10,000 years on a state-of-the-art conventional supercomputer. And that's really what it is, right? Whatever it is, it's involving computation, and that's most research in life and you just put the supercomputer to task. It doesn't mind. Uh, and this is really, I think, uh, <laughs> revolutionary. We're at this crazy precipice right now in, in human existence, right? Um, where it could, I mean, obviously it could go either way, but I, I, I hope we can get a rein on it because if we do all this right, if we do this quantum computing right, if we do this AI right, don't use it to destroy ourselves or whatever, uh, we could have a pretty, you know, just a new paradigm entirely than, than we have seen in history. Um, the Google computation also turned out to be less impressive than first appear. This is still obviously in its um, infancy. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff we is, at least the way that I see it, right? Like, we should really be championing this um, kind of research and discovery because at the end of the day, um, it's going to benefit all of us. And yeah, the old paradigm might go away, and that's always somewhat of a grading experience, and uh, it's easy to kind of naysay this type of stuff because it's just stuff that we're not familiar with, right? And that's kind of a part of the human condition, um, being a little bit hesitant of things that we're not familiar with. But, um, you know, we crack this, and if it's used for good, uh, yeah, it'll be quite a beautiful, quite a beautiful uh, thing. Um, let's take a look here. We were talking yesterday... Uh, about uh, cacao, uh, coffee beans are also experiencing it. Um, you know, I was talking about how Ghana was having, you know, their kind of day in the light with uh, the rest of the world and how they've been kind of taken advantage of, I guess, regarding their cacao prices. But um, they're also a major producer of uh, uh, coffee beans as well. So coffee consumption in the U.S. is at an all-time high. Uh, Two-thirds of us drinking coffee every day, of course. And from the land to labor, the price we pay for beans doesn't account for everything that goes into the coffee. Um, you know, plus with climate change, increasing drought and disease, farming is becoming an even riskier financial endeavor. Uh, but for more than 50 years, the price of unroasted green coffee and other commodities markets have averaged less than $2 a pound. And we were just talking about in the den, uh, you know, in St. Pete, I'm paying six bucks and I don't do this. 
but I've done it like a few times. <laughs> Six bucks for like a small little frappe, and it's just, uh, I mean, I don't know if I'm insane or something for doing that. Folks, stay tuned, we'll be right back. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. To uh, wrap up our little discussion on uh, the price of coffee and how that kind of works. So essentially, the price is determined by uh, bulk trade. That's 37500 per pound lot. What this article is saying essentially is that most uh, coffee beans actually come from small farms. So, you know, in a way their profits get diluted because they're not producing essentially in bulk, right? Their small amount um, is what incorporates that, that kind of that bulk volume. Uh, so a lot of the uh, coffee roasters are getting out of there and they're selling their farms and it'll be kind of interesting to see what happens about that. Um, for our little, I don't have an article up for it, but I was reading it last night. For our little science discussion for the day, um, I, I saw this headline uh, that was something like five million people in, um, you know, Austronesia in this region um, will will die from uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria in the next decade. And so I was kind of discussing this, and uh, I started researching, you know, what what are people doing in order to prevent this? And there's these little viruses called bacteriophages. Okay. And bacteriophage meaning uh, to, to eat in, in Greek. Um, and so uh, we were actually, the Western world was actually working on this before uh, penicillin was accidentally discovered. And then we went the way of antibiotics and about 100 years now since that point, uh, a lot of the, uh, by, uh, excuse me, a lot of the bacteria are uh, developing an immunity to it. And you know, that's because we've been dumping it into the environment 
and uh, overprescribing and, and so on. Uh, the Soviet Union never went that route, and they continued to develop bacteriophagial um, therapies. And uh, so a lot of people in Europe uh, that now have antibiotic-resistant uh, infections are going to places like Georgia um, in order to get some bacteriophagial um, kind of therapy. And I think that's really amazing. And there's uh, some people out in America, the active, um, I guess, enzyme that these viruses uh, use in order to break up and then uh, replicate within the bacteria, something called lysin. And there's a lab here in America that has synthesized lysin. And uh, apparently that's a more direct way. So keep in mind, keep a lookout for any kind of pharmaceutical companies that might be employing something like that in the, uh, the next decade. Folks, thank you so much for joining me. Like I said, Tom will be back Tuesday. We are out Monday. So is the rest of the market. Have a great night, folks. Building wealth trading in the stock